Okay. Okay. Good deal. Hopefully. Yeah. There we go. Uh, Steve Eastham here. I'm a, uh, a director of web architecture for BestBuy.com. Uh, with me today is. Uh, my name is Joel Crab. I'm the chief architect for BestBuy.com. Cool. So Joel is going to cover. Uh, let me go one more slide here. Joel is going to cover a lot of the background uh, about BestBuy.com. What we're doing is a platform kind of where we're headed is cloud overall, and then I'm going to pick up on our uh, particular use case with the CDC. Uh, great. So uh, apologize a little bit in advance if you went to the keynote, some of the slides we, we are reusing. Uh, and from coming from Best Buy, first I have to tell you a little bit about Best Buy. We're the world's largest e-commerce multi-channel retailer, as well as being the 11th largest e-commerce site. So we had about 1.6 billion visitors last year, and our reward zone program is one of the largest reward zone programs that exists. Uh, and what else? Oh yeah, we, every, we have outstanding uh, staff that tell you unbiased uh, things about all the great devices that we sell. So uh, impartial and knowledgeable advice, competitive prices, and ability to shop anywhere you want, and that's, that's the spiel from Best Buy itself. Now let's get to the good stuff. We started looking at uh, cloud in about 2010. And what we started with was that uh, we, we had the need to have a, a disaster recovery site. So we created what we called DR Lite, which was a very lightweight site that does both browse, search, inventory, store lookup, and store locations. And the reason for that for us was a lot of our traffic that we get on bestbuy.com is really people going to the site, seeing if things are, are available in the store, and then going to the store. So even if we're on an outage in bestbuy.com, we still want to support all the people that are going to the, to the site to try and find out what's in the store. So this was a big thing for us. We, we built this out, we put it onto a cloud vendor, and we can pull this up in about 10 minutes. It sits cloud resident all the time, and then we really just have to elastically scale it out whenever we want to have an outage or an outage window for bestbuy.com. Not that we ever want to have those, but it does happen occasionally. Next, there's a few smaller properties that are also in the cloud. Uh, My reward zone is probably the best known one. That's completely cloud resident, except for a little bit of database on the back end. And then what happened kind of naturally was many teams that were out there started to use cloud for testing. As, as in most companies, infrastructure is always a little bit tough. Uh, procurement and getting things actually built out in data centers takes longer than most teams are willing to wait. And many teams just started using cloud resources to do that. So you saw the slide earlier. We had a cloud re-architecture. We're in the process of re-architecturing bestbuy.com. We're turning it into a new e-commerce platform. As part of that, we have a very large amount of our traffic is what we call just browse and search. People come into the site looking at stuff, searching for products. That's uh, upwards of 90% of our traffic. And as you can see from this graph, this is just pulled off Wolfram Alpha. Alpha. Our, our traffic spike around Thanksgiving timeframe is about seven times our normal traffic. So as we looked at our various traffic, it's quite obvious that elastically scaling our browse and search platform and having only to use that many resources during Thanksgiving uh, for you know, one week of the year is much better in a cloud than trying to build that out in our data center, which is something that we've done every year prior to starting to go move the architecture towards the cloud. And then as we said, Today, the first time we're really talking about it, we actually served about 25% of our traffic last year, uh, bestbuy.com, during holiday. From about July onwards, we served about 25% of our traffic off of our cloud architecture. So really high level, what are we doing at Best Buy on the browse layer? Uh, we're putting a global traffic manager in front of uh, multiple clouds. We're going for multiple cloud vendors. We're really not trying to get locked into any particular vendor and multiple vendors because vendors typically fail occasionally and we don't want to be tied to just one to serve our browser architecture. So we can transfer between multiple cloud 
uh, vendors through the global traffic management at any time. And then a lot of data still comes, our traffic still comes back to our data center itself. All the commerce traffic, all the secure traffic, that's still all served by our data center. A slightly lower level view of what we're doing in the cloud is you know, we, it's pretty similar to the Samsung guys view who have, if you guys were here for the last presentation. Uh, you know, we, we have cloud load balancers in front, uh, web application tier, Tomcats in general. And we have a very high scaling service aggregation tier. So we, we take a huge amount of traffic. Uh, last year estimates were that we were the number three traffic site during holiday. So we, we have traffic similar to the biggest players in e-commerce. And so our service aggregation tier, the main point of it is really, really highly scaled, really high caching, and to serve up uh, disparate services, 30 to 50 services that we're calling at any given time for any given call for any uh, product detail page. And putting that all together, serving it back out to the page in, in all in less than about a second. And then as you see, we've reflected this architecture across multiple clouds, multiple vendors, multiple availability zones, multiple regions for the increased reliability and scalability that you get from that. And then we still have a lot of data in the, in the back in our data center. And the one thing you do see at the bottom is our product data. Our product catalog is one thing that we've scaled out to, uh, to be cloud resident as well. So the product catalog actually replicates out from our data center into all the different cloud regions that you're seeing. And to serve up, uh, we serve about 90% of our page from the cloud right now, from the product detail pages, and we're trying to get to 100% this year. A clicker seems to only have to click twice. So as you saw before, what, what, did, what does this mean for customers for us, which is really where it boils down to? It, well, we think it means a better experience. And if you describe a better experience as a better, cleaner product detail page, the one on the right here is our new product detail page that we put in as we put in our cloud architecture, versus the one on the left is our old product detail page, uh, which is served by our data center. And you'll see that we rolled this out over time. So category by category, we started to put in the new architecture and move it to the cloud so that we came very slowly up onto the cloud. We, we started out at 0%, at and then we went to like 1% or 2%, and then as we ramped up over the course of months before holiday this year, we ramped all the way up to about 25% of our traffic being served off of our cloud. So the best part of it for us is that this page is just significantly faster than the other page. This page, the old page, had a lot of post-rendered JavaScript, so as you loaded the page onto your client, onto your browser, it would go off and call um, 50, 60 sometimes third parties to kind of fill in the rest of the page as it built. And as you all know that that's not very reliable. The various vendors that are supplying the third party content don't necessarily have the SLA that we want from them. And so that's why the range can be anywhere from like seven seconds to 30 seconds. It really depends on your particular connection and whether the vendors are working well today. So what we did as part of this cloud program is we've actually pulled out that, all that data that was being served up post-render on, on the page and we put it through the servers and now we render the entire page to you at once. So we get a much more consistent experience. It's usually about two, two and a half seconds in general. And that leads to better consumer uh, views of our pages and, and happier people. And we all like that at Best Buy. So what, what we are getting to today, though, is if we go back to all of our test, all of our teams started using various vendors' clouds to do their testing, it became very um, chaotic. So at any time, we might have 40 different teams working in parallel across BestBuy.com. And it all rolls up into one massive build right now. So they all have to integrate at some point. And what was happening, because our, our, our lower environments really weren't up to snuff, a lot of those teams started to just move to the cloud because you know, they couldn't get their things provisioned in our, in our integration environments. Uh, integration environments were failing. They had 40 teams trying to use like four or five different integration environments. It just really doesn't work. So 
they all went off and just built their own stuff. And, and you got really serious inconsistencies in what they were building. They had, uh, oh, it got really expensive too because teams would go off and they'd, they'd build up a, a environment and then they'd just kind of walk away from it. And it would just sit out there, you know, clock in a couple cents a, an hour on stuff. But it all adds up when you got 40 teams doing this kind of thing. And so what we ended up doing is we, we decided we needed a solution for this problem. And the solution that we came up with is what we now call our continuous delivery cloud. We built an OpenStack cloud that we allow all of these teams to use as tenants and give them basically free access to build their own test environments. And on top of that, we tried to media, uh, mediate the inconsistencies by giving them uh, the ability to deploy what is very close to a bestbuy.com uh, production environment with a click of the button into these these environments that we had for each team. So now every team is working on consistent architecture and consistent infrastructure as they go to do their individual testing. So when they finally get to the integration testing, we no longer have the problem that these teams haven't tested their own stuff first before testing it in conjunction with everybody else. And so Steve's going to talk about what we actually built. And this is where I hand it over to him. Oh, very cool. All right. So I'm going to go back to the Wayback Machine. When we were uh, started uh, looking at this, it was in mid-2011. We ran a VSM exercise looking at uh, how much we spent uh, for a major release. Um, VSM is kind of a lean manufacturing concept. Toyota has used it uh, successfully. But we looked at what were the friction points. Those friction points were around you know, a lot of the data, a lot of the manual, you know, we, you know, a lot of the communication teams asking other teams, hey, can you load this data for me? Uh, can you move this build out here to this, uh, this set of infrastructure? And, uh, you know, uh, you know, a large uh, part of those costs uh, were discrepancies, regressions that, that uh, found their way in, and uh, availability problems, right? So that's what happens, right? You have more hands doing things manually, right? You get more and more trouble. Uh, we also uh, needed to find a way to get more parallel development. We had, at the time, three uh, QA uh, uh, swim lanes. And you know all the teams are all trying to integrate at that QA environment, not earlier. Uh, so it was really you know, trying to find a way to get earlier integration, uh, get things happening earlier and better. Um, and then we, uh, when you're just looking at the cost of infrastructure, uh, our uh, cost structure uh, it was about $20,000. It could be even higher for a fully managed, you know, with monitoring the whole nine yards, uh, just a VM on an infrastructure that uh, we had put in place. So that couldn't continue. We knew we couldn't continue to scale. At that time, we did not know that we were going to get the green light for uh, our new platform that Joel's been talking about that we've been rolling out. We're going to continue to roll that out. Um, you'll see in our quarterly analyst calls on the street, we're going to be talking about that and some of the new things coming. Um, can't really get into too much detail. I'll let, I'll let uh, our CEO talk about that. Um, and then we didn't know that we're going to need that rapid pace, uh, You know, have more automation, more APIs, more teams be able to run in parallel. And uh, we needed to do that to, to get our new platform out the door by holiday last year. So what our continuous delivery cloud provides us, it's an innovation catalyst. Our teams can go in. If they're looking at uh, uh, launching some new cache technology, some new, uh, new NoSQL platform, whatever they need, uh, you know, they can jump ahead. They can go do it themselves. Um, we also kind of coined a, uh, we ran a product team, like a little mini uh, team uh, still running today. And they, uh, they built a push-button development environment in Jenkins called OmniTank. Again, don't know about the name, but it's an awesome name. <laughs> um, and uh, developers can go in and uh, fire up their test environment just on demand. They just fill out a form. Up comes a test environment. They get their app server. They get the web server. They get everything they need. Uh, they get DNS names uh, for that, uh, the name that they give it. Um, so it's really kind of an integrated thing. Uh, then, you know, more the, the more advanced teams, if they want to build their own OmniTank, they want to build their own PaaS uh, and launch it, they've got the full API-driven uh, capabilities of OpenStack there for them. Uh, and again, we talked about earlier integration in the last slide. 
The whole goal in web development, especially parallel development, is like understand your dependencies on other teams earlier. If you're waiting too late in the game, you'll get into regressions, you know, uh, deadlines will slip, not a good thing. And then finally, the more automated you are, the better things are going to go. Uh, people are in there touching things by hand. Uh, you're guaranteed to have failures. Architecture. So for you techies out there, we'll get deep into uh, the architecture we use in the CDC. Um, the whole goal was to have scalability. Uh, just like we need to scale BestBuy.com, have scalability at all three uh, parts here. So compute, storage, and network have, have uh, really a, a horizontal scale uh, kind of approach. Um, when we were looking at uh, building out the CDC a little over a year ago, Ubuntu 12.04 was actually in beta. So was uh, Essex. Uh, we launched, we, we made the choice. It was like they came to me, hey, dude, this stuff's in beta. <laughs> uh, and as a product owner, I'm like, okay, well, I felt comfortable with Essex because I've been on the mailing list, and I tell you what, the kind of testing that we're trying to get to, they were doing. The, the, the guys running OpenStack, they were running that automated testing, running through, and they had that continuous integration world going. And so I felt comfortable that they had really good test coverage going into that release. So we, we went with a beta version of Ubuntu and a beta version of Essex uh, uh, 2012. And uh, you know we've upgraded along the way to get past uh, beta, but it, it's been rock solid. I mean, even the beta, I mean, launching, going up to 100 VMs within like a week or so uh, worked really well. Um, again, we use Glance, uh, typical file-backed images, uh, copy on write kind of world. Um, uh, we support most all images of uh, CentOS and Ubuntu. Our production environments run uh, a lot of Red Hat, uh, primarily to have some of the support um, uh, around, um, uh, around Java. Uh, have they actually supported stack if you need to open a ticket with a vendor. We haven't had a lot of that, but we do. Um, and then uh, standard Keystone setup. Our scale-out storage, uh, we'll get into lessons learned. We actually did not launch originally on Ceph. We launched on a different product, uh, and then oh, a few months in, we pivoted off of it. We'll get into that in lessons learned and kind of what our, uh, our experience has been there. Um, what we use is a four terabyte shared file system for the actual images. Uh, once you pick an image, a certain flavor of an image, uh, it puts it into the base directory. Those of you that run OpenStack know this. Uh, and what we decided to do was push that block device out, use OCFS2, and what that gives us is the more often an image is launched a certain flavor, uh, the faster it's going to load because every single host is reading and they're caching, right, in the file buffer cache. They've got uh, quick reads on the, those, uh, those base images. So what that allows us is really fast launch times. We're not copying big files around. I mean, the first person that launches it, right, they're paying the price. But after that, everyone else is, uh, is paying for it. And, and uh, you'll get it, or uh, not having to pay for it. But as we get into the, uh, the kind of numbers and more detail, you'll see how important that is. We have a lot of uh, VMs that launch. We run automated tests and tear them back down. If you don't have really fast launch, you're copying big files around, not a, not a good thing. Um, then on every host server, we have a one terabyte file system, a uh, block device, that uh, all the actual data is written to. So all the, the writes go to one volume, all the reads on the, uh, the shared volume. Uh, then we have, uh, with Ceph, we use the S3 gateway so uh, teams can have uh, 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 images uh, that they want to put out there if they have a you know, like a, a big file or some sort of, uh, you know, anything that, you know, typical object storage. Uh, and then uh, we use uh, iSCSI targets uh, um, for uh, Nova volumes. But a lot of our stuff is just on the base image. Uh, teams will spin up larger base images, and, and uh, most all of our stuff runs on the base image. Uh, scale out network um, is kind of an interesting deal. Our network team had kind of put a, a good core of Nexus gear in, I guess Nexus 5K, 7K, 2K, all that stuff. Um, all we had to do, we'll get into funding, was uh, provide or, or, or buy the 2K fiber extenders. And uh, we use three 1 gig interfaces per host. So we use you know, one for fixed network, 
one for the floating at work and one for the storage. So all that storage writes and reads and all goes over a different interface. Uh, our, our sizing for the internal, because this is all internal space, is uh, a slash 18 uh, for the fixed uh, and a slash 22 for the floating. Um, you know, and then we have a quota around you know, how many addresses each team can have. Um, and right now, it'll be part of our roadmap slide, we're just running the, the multi-NIC uh, flat DHCP kind of world. Uh, we know that won't get us uh, full scalability, so we're looking into Grizzly and some of that. Server hardware, uh, rack-mounted commodity. Uh, our first purchase was 24-core machines. Uh, they were uh, two two socket, 24-core. And then by the time, like a month or two later, when we bought, uh, purchased the second rack, you know, we got you know for less price, we got you know even more cores, right? So we got 16-core uh, uh, times two socket servers. Uh, our latest build out is some 1U servers just for compute. So I'll get into, I have a picture here in a second. And then uh, one gig networking. It's the, the current servers, the two racks we have, they're modular. You could plug the two and a half inch hard drives into them and make them storage servers if you wanted to. Uh, and then again, kind of getting into the Ceph uh, distributed storage, uh, we use, you know, some people have coined it RAIN, redundant array of inexpensive nodes uh, versus RAID. Uh, so we use the 10K SAS drives. For the cost, the amount of space you get, uh, and the size and the servers we're buying, the 10K SAS were the right mix for us. This is what one of our racks looks like. Don't know which one it was. Could have been the first one, could have been the second one. All the servers at the top with the one little red dot. That's one hard drive. That's just, the, just for the uh, base OS. Um, four at the bottom is, uh, are the uh, storage nodes that... Uh, that have the uh, 16 uh, SAS drives in them. Bootstrap, Crowbar, uh, it's a wise investment in my opinion and, uh, and uh, what we've learned. Um, provides us with uh, bare metal install. So uh, it has a, an ISO image and Pixie setup. So anytime we plug a new uh, node in, it shows up, you drag, you drop it, up comes a storage node, up comes a compute node. Um, config management for the host servers, uh, we'll get into a little bit more about that. Uh, base monitoring comes with Nagios, uh, uh, Ganglia, uh, that kind of thing. Costs, everybody's always interested in costs. Ours was not really around costs, but costs are, you know, it's good to have uh, work on it and have the cost model uh, good. So roughly around uh, 81K a rack uh, for um, hardware. We add in roughly 10K for labor from the network team, the rack and stack guys, uh, then your total you know, cost per rack around 91K. Big difference from $20,000 of provision VM to, to this, uh, this kind of cost model just to put stuff in the data center. Uh, config management, um, we use, uh, we license ops code private chef. We offer that to all the teams that use the CDC uh, they can have their own tenant. We have automation around that. Kind of gives us a scale. We like the multi-tenancy. We've been running and operating in Chef for a long time. We go back to that 2010 use case with uh, our DR Lite site. Uh, that was, I think, on Chef 0.8. Boy, how things have changed there since then. Uh, Chef Solo, we, uh, uh, we'll kind of talk about lessons learned. We don't like going in and tweaking the crowbar stuff a whole lot. We're going to look at crowbar again. It's part of our uh, our next steps, but in our roadmap. But uh, we'll uh, we'll use crowbar for the initial, and you know it'll sit there and run and apply. You know, make sure the policy is the way it wants. But if we're rolling out like monitoring, we'll get into that. Uh, we use Chef Solo a lot, uh, so we'll just check all our stuff in, run Chef Solo scripts. Uh, we'll get into that. Um, Jenkins. Uh, push button Jenkins from Jenkins. I think uh, we were in a presentation yesterday about this and that caught somebody's eye. So the idea is that you give a team the master Jenkins. They can go in, fill out a form, push a button, they get their own Jenkins. It's something we moved to lately. We, we tried all different models. We tried, you know, dedicated slaves for teams. We tried, you know, uh, all sorts of things. But it's getting to the point where if you're a, a power user kind of team, why not give you Jenkins uh, button, push button Jenkins, right? So you can have your own. Um, we've used Knife OpenStack. We still use Knife OpenStack for some things. Uh, it's obviously used a fog library. 
But we have recently developed our own tool called Ginsu. It helps us with uh, managing our chef uh, dependencies, integrates with our Git repository. And the key thing is that we've extended uh, the API functionality to go beyond what Knife OpenStack provides. So, you know, like volume support. Uh, and as we, you know, evolve this, we'll open source this. This is one thing we can do. We have approval to open source just about anything chef right now. Uh, so you'll see Gensu out there. We have a GitHub site, uh, Best Buy uh, Chef. I don't have the link up here, but I can get it. Uh, I don't know why I didn't put it in anyway. But we will be open sourcing Gensu. It's not out yet, so I didn't want to go too deep into it. Um, that covers that. Uh, monitoring, uh, cloud monitoring, both for our production clouds and internals. You know, it's a unique kind of challenge when you're looking at. Uh, uh, you know, the, the scalability, the, the uh, elasticity, you know, instances come up, they're gone, uh, they move around a lot. Uh, so the traditional uh, monitoring techniques that, that I'm very well aware of uh, kind of start to fall down in this world. So we kind of, you know, we use a lot of the same tools in production as well. But in our, our CDC, we use Sensu, Collecti, Graphite, and we have a custom dashboard. We'll get into all those in depth here. Sensu, not the prettiest baby out there for the GUI, but uh, it's got, you know, it's, it's about the API, not the GUI. Um, Self-registering, uh, JSON, configs, and uh, it's, an ex it's an expanding community. I think it's an awesome uh, tool. Uh, Collecti, we use that for the systems collection. Uh, has good, you know, good performance, and it's mature. It's been around a while. Graphite, scalable graphing. Um, kind of fits into our distributed computing world we're moving to. Uh, you kind of feed it data. It's kind of like a, you know, graphing as a service, if you will. Uh, Orbitz uh, released this back a few years ago at one of the Java conferences. And uh, I've, uh, I've used it at several companies now. Um, easy to input data into the carbon back end, and then it has a lot of functions. So this is a picture. One of our nodes will get into some of the things that we have changed in Essex or tweaks we've made. So we can take hosts out of the pool and then do operations on them, whatever, you know, test a patch, whatever, and then put them back in the pool. You can see this host going back up into the pool recently. This is our dashboard. In reality, this is one screen, but it doesn't look good on the thing, so I broke it into two. Um, so starting on the top left is our uh, master Jenkins as a service. Uh, obviously more little red spikes there. That's when something is down. Uh, we'll roll out uh, packages all the time. So, you know, somebody wants a new version of Groovy or something. So a lot of that is uh, us uh, deploying uh, new packages for Jenkins. Next one down is the dashboard, whether the uh, 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 OpenStack dashboard is up. Uh, the next one is Ceph, our uh, storage layer, and uh, uh, Ceph Rados, and then uh, our, the API. So chest, this is kind of modeled after the, the AWS or, you know, or the rack space um, uh, status. Uh, in fact, that's a, the URL is status uh, to it. Um, on the right top up here is active instances running. Uh, in this case, we're right around 494. We've been up and down. It could, you know, it can go up 100 or 50 uh, during a day or down. Um, and it just depends upon who's doing what. Um, total instances created for the last year, 14,700, and, and uh, it was funny, we were talking about that when we first got the dashboard built, and we're almost to 10,000, and we're like, hey, we should have a party, we hit 10,000, by, by, by the time that we uh, started talking about it, we're already well past 10,000, so we're like, okay, well, I'll have to pick another number, it's too late. Um, roadmap. So the roadmap for the CDC, uh, not speaking to Best Buy overall, just bestbuy.com, CDC. I'm going to be looking at hardware options. I was uh, pleasantly surprised. I saw that Facebook has a, a guy talking about open compute. He's back in the corner, so you have to find him. But, uh, but uh, it was actually quite, quite cool. Um, and then we've talked to HP with, about their recent moonshot. There's other vendors. I just mentioned a couple. Um, so it's really looking at, at how we can uh, really uh, you know, pack more more gear into less space with less voltage. So it's not everybody's trying to do the same thing. Uh, bootstrap, kind of relook at uh, Crowbar. Look at uh, we were at Matt Ray's presentation yesterday. I don't know if Matt's here, but uh, and uh, he kind of called out a few things there. 
where uh, OpenStack, I mean, uh, sorry, o ops code for OpenStack was his presentation. Um, expansion of our current cloud, we talked about compute. We have additional compute we're building out. Uh, and then we're gonna be adding a second instance of the CDC, don't know what we'll call it. Um, yet we'll have to find some new, new and tricky name for it because you know that third uh, subdomain is CDC right now, so we need a new name for it. Uh, and then looking at 10 gig networking, again, we talked about using three one gig connections today to kind of split the traffic. Uh, really want to get to commodity 10 gig as we move forward. Uh, OpenStack upgrade, so we're probably going to skip uh, the whole Folsom release. Um, I don't I really just haven't even had time to look at it, to be honest with you. I mean, we're on what we're on. Uh, it's been stable. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we'll look ahead to Grizzly. A lot of good stuff in there. Part of that is some of the sender, you know, the RBD backed instances and volumes. Uh, Looking at the storage software upgrade, uh, we've had that on the, the docket for a couple iterations, kind of paused on that. We'll, we're gonna look at uh, Bobtail. I know that somebody's gonna be presenting about that while we're here. Uh, Quantum Open vSwitch SDN. So trying to get to uh, software-defined networking, get away from the flat DHCP networking. We know that you know you hit about probably 1,500 machines in a VLAN, uh, you'll run into trouble. That's uh, too much broadcast traffic. What it does for us, this is, unfortunately, this is, a, if you were at the keynote, this is a rehash, but uh, for you, those of you that weren't there, uh, we're really uh, trying to get to a developer-driven culture, uh, you know, more of the self-service, less of the, uh, the teams that you would go and open a ticket with, um, you know, and uh, really remove the blame game. So teams aren't like, well, I can't release because, you know, I can't, can't make my date because, you know, the environments weren't good enough. Uh, so we really get to the point where it's more of a self-service world and the teams are uh, really taking, uh, taking it upon themselves, taking the initiative. Uh, parallel development, we've talked about that a couple times, and then you know, the teams are free to innovate uh, and uh, reducing the cycle time. Uh, what it's all about. Okay, lessons learned. Uh, talked about that a few times. Um, so uh, you know, again, we don't mess with Crowbar a whole lot. Um, once you initially run the, the packages, you have the, uh, the server comes up, you drag it into a category and then uh, launch it. Uh, we're not going into the bar clamps and the recipes and using that chef to really manage moving forward a lot of our deployments. Um, we'll be looking at that, talk about that. Storage, we first initially launched, we launched on a file-based uh, cloud storage. Uh, I think Red Hat's bought the company since, it's uh, Gluster. Uh, we learned a, a few lessons there. The thing about Gluster, I think it's a good product. Um, it, uh, it has some unique features that we saw, but, but the one thing that we didn't like, we learned, uh, was that you don't see in testing if you have really large images. So let's say we have a team that uh, runs a NoSQL uh, cluster and they have, let's say, 200 gig images. And you take a, you know, have a storage server problem of some kind. Take it out of the pool, put it back in the pool. When it's out of the pool, it's fine. So it handles a, a, uh, an outage fine. It's when you try to resync it, all the file systems go read only. And the big ones take a long time. We're talking four hours. So we, didn't, we didn't, really didn't like the recovery of that. Um, you know, someone could come up to me and say, well, you did it wrong, and that's all great. I would love to hear that, but I'll tell you what, we just did not have the time. We had to pivot off of it, move to something that was a little more self-healing, and if it, re, it, it, uh, it experienced a failure, getting back on your feet didn't take teams down. So again, most everybody was fine. It was just the one team with the 200 gig uh, root images that were, that were affected for a while. Um, so that was a lesson learned. Um, took us a while to pivot and uh, implement Ceph, you know, one host at a time kind of thing. Um, and then uh, tools, uh, we talked about Knife OpenStack. I think Knife OpenStack is fine and all, and, and people are using it. It just doesn't have the full support. I think even you know, Matt talked about that yesterday. It's, it's kind of an evolutionary thing, and that's why we've moved to our Ginsu setup. We can easily add uh, support for uh, new APIs, for volumes, uh, and uh, the team has started moving that way. They may, you know, we'll see what happens with the community. Um, OpenStack, pretty darn stable. Uh, talked about that in the keynote. Uh, Essex has been really solid. It's everything we expected it to be. Um, and uh, the other one is kind of funny. If you're having trouble and everyone in the whole department logs in, 
the dashboard, you'll crash the API. DDoS it yourself, kind of learned that. It's kind of funny. Um, and then uh, kernel updates, lots of little tweaks here and there. We, you know, we would uh, you know, be on a certain ver version of Ubuntu, certain kernel, and then some, something would hit us, right? We would you know, be uploading images or you know, maybe the resize command would hit some weird bug. But for the most part, we've, everything we ever uh, looked at, by the time that we found it, it was, there was already, you know, community had patched it. It was already out in a, in, a, in a Ubuntu update. So not a big deal there, just time. Um, and uh, our changes for Essex, we put in a filter for the scheduler uh, that allows hosts to be taken out of the pool. But you can still launch in the host. You just have to have the right metadata you launch. Um, dashboard enhancements, we added a bunch of links and, and uh, RSS feed stuff uh, to our support blog. And then uh, some small bug fixes like the volume create. Um, and that's pretty much it. Hopefully uh, everybody absorbed that. I went pretty fast. I don't know, we're ahead of time, behind time. You want to come up as well? Come up and do Q&A. Um, anybody have questions? Yes, uh, actually, do you want to step to the mic? So everybody can hear? Really loudly. OK. <laughs> so if your executives are aware of what you guys are doing for this part of the infrastructure. Yes. What's the opportunity to bleed this into other parts of the infrastructure stuff that maybe doesn't touch this? Yeah. You want to cover that? Yeah. So we, we actually talked about this a little bit yesterday, too. We're building what we need for BestBuy.com right now. Yeah. We're both .com guys. We have a lot of connections with the enterprise. Enterprise and Best Buy as a whole is looking at all sorts of things for cloud right now. We can't really go into that too much. But we feel like what we've built is, is world class, world leading, and that we're publicizing it to our executives and to anybody that wants to hear about it. We actually have teams uh, from the enterprise side that actually use our CDC for their own development. So we're kind of more going about it as we're putting this stuff out there. We built it. We're using it. If anyone wants to use it, we allow them to use it. And we're eventually waiting for people to come back to us with the questions about, hey, how'd you guys do that? Which are already starting. Yeah. Cool. Back here. You want to? Yeah, that's probably wise. The last meeting, uh, no one was happy because no one could hear. They almost so. had a riot about the mic. <laughs> Question on your, uh, on your uh, you know, total cost uh, of ownership, because uh -huh. you guys said that there were 40 teams and a bunch of them were working on the cloud, like putting stuff out, I'm assuming, in AWS or Azure and stuff. And then you brought something back. Uh -huh. uh, how do you compare the two? And the, the, the comparison I saw was $20,000 per VM, which was, I think, internal. Yeah. Your own private, uh, I mean, your own sort of in-house implementation versus yeah. what you have, which is still private cloud. Yeah. So it's just, uh, how did you think about full cloud, uh, you know, full outside public cloud versus private? I can get this one. Yeah, so a couple of interesting things. The $20,000 a provision VM is not cloud. That is uh, data center virtualization kind of stuff. Um, costs for the cloud are interesting. The problem is everyone spun up clouds. All sorts of product owners across the company spun up cloud test environments. And it's tough to know how much they were spending. Or even if, you know, as Joel said, you know, there's a bunch of uh, machines just kind of like, you know, who knows what happened to them, right? There's kind of like floating through people's credit, you know, corporate cards up through the, up through the balance sheet somewhere, right? So, um, you know, that, this has been a, a way of, of getting away from that, right? And that's, that's hard to track. So I don't really have a great answer for you on uh, public cloud costs because, again, it's, it was hodgepodge, people every which way doing it. What we're trying to do is get standard here and, uh, and really uh, reduce that, that, that overall thing. It was high enough that people, executives, were getting mad about the cost, of, the rolled up cost that, they were That seeing. is true. <laughs> so, cool. Yeah, so we started with one rack. Um, they were, it's, uh, you know, that's the, uh, the 12 servers at 24 cores. And then we added a second rack of 12 servers at 32 cores. So, I don't know, is that seven, 800 core range? Um, and, uh, you know, we, we think we can sustain in the low thousands of VMs. Um, you know, we, we're up there in the mid hundreds and it'll burst, you know, uh, higher than what you saw. Uh, so, uh, does that kind of give an answer that you're looking for? Oh, and then, sorry, I didn't, the, the, the follow-up, uh, probably about, I think we have about 40 terabytes of online storage. Uh, you know, that's counting the redundancy thing with uh, the block storage, uh, object storage. Uh-huh.
So you talk about developer-driven uh, teams, and one yeah. of the biggest impediments, I think, to private cloud deployment is often the disconnect between developers and IT. So IT has a certain set of uh, functions and parameters that it needs to operate within, mm -hmm. and yet developers are looking for a whole different set. So yeah. to what extent and how did you make sure that you brought developers into this so yeah. that what you were building was actually something that they really wanted to use, but yeah. at the same time would also meet your guys' needs? I can talk to that. So I, it's interesting. It, I'll let you follow up as well. Um, so I have a couple teams. Uh, one is the automation tools team. That was a, I don't know if that, uh, if that picture didn't make it into the final keynote, but um, some of the guys are here in the room. Uh, so that team uh, actually engineered, deployed the OpenStack. They deployed Jenkins. They deploy a lot of different tools um, for different teams. Um, and then I also have a product owner for like Cloud Browse, right, which is our render tier for BestBuy.com. So I have teams that use those services, right? So it's kind of interesting being the product owner. You know, you've got one team using it, another team uh, deploying it. Uh, so again, we are our biggest customer. Uh, we have pulled in a lot of other teams across Best Buy. We have, uh, you know, like our EIP, our security team using it. We have enterprise teams using it. Um, and so, you know, we've driven, you know, a lot of the features and things out of our own ecosystem within our product development org. And then uh, we have, you know, again, as Joel said, kind of driving it into the rest of the company nicely. Yeah, we, also, we had about five or six teams that were basically the early adopters of the cloud. And they, I remember some of these meetings, they pushed back hard on these guys when the cloud wasn't performing for them. Because from their point of view as a developer, hey, you just gave me this cloud, you took away my, cloud, my external cloud environments, but your internal cloud's not scaling or it's going down or whatnot. So there was a couple of months there where it was pretty contentious. I don't actually wouldn't say contentious, but there was a lot of back and forth between the teams about, hey, this is what we need. We're not getting it. And then the, the, the ad ad team, the team that, that built the cloud, going back and, and fixing all these little pieces that, as it went along. So okay. you know, it's not super clean, but if you have teams that are willing to work together, then it actually worked out great. Yep. Right here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Repeat so the question. Uh, I, yeah, I'll take. What's Repeat that? the question. So. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. So he he wanted me to clarify on the storage. We use uh, Ceph, uh, you know, for the the distributed block storage, object storage as well, and then we use uh, LVM uh, iSCSI target. So here's what it is. Um, if we're if you're launching a VM and you're launching that base image, no matter how big it is, 200 gig, 300 gig, I talked about those teams, that is going to be launched on and written to, you know, on the, the copy on write, to that one terabyte volume, that block device, that is on each host. Okay, every host has a one terabyte volume, right? So, it's, you know, basically all the writes go there. We also have a Ceph device, right, a, a block device, but it's using OCFS2, to be a shared block device. Almost like, you know, if you have shared SAN and, you know, you, multiple nodes can read from that or write and there's locking involved. We're using OCF, OCFS2 and it works out really well because reads can, are, are, you know, reads can happen, right? And there's no locking involved, right? So every, all these nodes have that, the base image directory, right, mounted with a uh, OCFS2 volume and all the reads, right, they're, ne they're never going to impact each other. And that's mostly what that is, right? The writes only happen when a new image flavor combination happens somewhere. And then they get copied out there, right? So does that make sense? Um, and, and, then, and then last, lastly, sorry, the, the, um, the uh, Nova volume, like you go in and you want to attach a volume to do a backup or something, that's not using uh, the, uh, the Ceph uh, stuff, right? That's just... Uh, a couple of nodes with uh, uh, whatever, it's uh, like a redundancy thing. Anyway, cool. Someone else, right here? We did, we looked, I mean, we're, we're going back, um, going back about two years now, at uh, mid-2011. Um, uh, if you go back to the mailing list, you'll see that I, I was out there asking people about Diablo. I, I ran a small POC on Diablo myself as an architect, just kind of looking at, 
how it worked. Um, I mean, there was other clouds. I'm trying to remember back then, that I guess there was v, v Cloud or some stuff from VMware. I would say the key thing is, is that at the time that we chose it, it was the best that was API driven. The closest thing to a public cloud API at that time, and we didn't want to go to something that was halfway there, right? Like a V Cloud or something like that. So we wanted something that would be, again, API driven, give us a RESTful interface, something that can scale. We figured we could take it from there as an engineering team. Yeah, we didn't do an RFP either, if that's no, what kind of thinking no, no, about. No, no, we no, just no. went out and looked at the products and picked one. Yeah. So, no, uh, no big formal RFP because we did it ourselves. Uh, so, uh, this being a dev test environment use case, and uh, um, besides price, are you looking at any other metric which shows you that this has been a success? For example, reduced tickets, more features per development cycle, faster development cycles. How? Yeah, are you those going last to ones. <laughs> <laughs> So, Make it actually launching your stuff on time and, and getting more and more releases and faster release cycles. I mean, that's what it's about, but I'll let Joel. Yeah, so a couple, we're not really formally tracking metrics, but we have gone down from a monthly release cycle to a two week release cycle. And a lot of that is because all these teams can go off and create their own test environments and test their code. So there's lots of other factors going into all these things, as you probably know, but we think that that's a big win itself. We've also haven't really advertised the fact that this cloud exists and have just been working on word of mouth. And I think we went, you, you can do the exact numbers, from, from zero to how many tenants do we have in the course of about three months? Um, we were up in the, you know, like probably 30 to, 30 to 40 within just a couple months. Yeah, so teams so. were hearing about this and they were just coming to us. So, so yeah, no, no formal metrics though. Yeah, go over here. I think he's going to... Oh, okay. Actually, yeah, let oh, me let him... Then you'll what, be next. What do you do for life cycle management? We saw the big picture of the zombies. Do <laughs> uh, you have a comment on that? Or? Yeah. I mean, we just started a spring cleaning effort. <laughs> Looking over here at Shane. He's one of the lead guys. Um, you know, most of our stuff, we're trying to get the teams to use Jenkins, kind of move it up a level and fire your stuff, fire up your, your Selenium tests and tear it down. That's where we ended up with that 14,000 number in one year. Uh, yeah, so yeah. obviously... We have a good chunk of the, the community using the rapid, you know, launch it, run your tests, or run through your stuff and tear it down. We probably have about a 20% range there of teams that aren't able to do that or, or have stuff uh, left around. One thing we do is we require every team that, uh, that uh, goes into the cloud to provide us an email address, uh, a Skype ID, that kind of thing. So, you know, if they had a few running and they just kind of sit there after a while, sure. we'll go through and send an email, hey, what's going on here? But some teams are in that 20% that run for a long time. It's not easy for them to build and tear down because they have like no SQL clusters and, you know, they're using those two or 300 gig volumes and right. loading their data is not something that's easy, right? So right. you just don't tear those kind of platforms down and rebuild them from scratch all the time. Uh, so those teams kind of tend to run longer. Thanks. Okay. Actually, let's go back here. I can repeat the question. Yeah, yeah, I can talk about that. So, um, yeah, let me think probably the best segue into that. So we're using this as a automated test, uh, you know, continuous integration kind of world. Um, even for like cloud browse, we have uh, tools from Akamai that help us simulate, like the edge side includes the fragments for the page. So we're, we're testing, prototyping, integrating there. Uh, then we're going out to a, like a staging pre-prod environment. And then we, we so, but the key thing I would say is like, you know, like from the G's Humble book is uh, we're using the same war, right? The same uh, ar artifact and it starts, right? Very early on and then goes all the way up and through production. And that's, and that's a recent change for our legacy platform, which Joel said we've gotten up to two releases a month from one. But in our cloud platform, we've done that from the beginning, right? We have... Uh, you know, so you're starting there, you're, you're the same archive, we use Artifactory as like an uh, artifact uh, system, and that same artifact is, is then getting pushed through the different environments uh, and uh, eventually makes it to production. Um, the other nice thing is the global traffic manager we showed in the slide, that actually helps us release in our new platform in production because we can turn off a, uh, a uh, cloud instance and uh, take all traffic off in about 10 minutes and deploy everything, run through our testing, um, and then um, 
uh, you know, final regression testing and then turn traffic back on. And if you know something went wrong, you always turn, you know, turn traffic back off, remix traffic, get a patch out there really fast, uh, that kind of thing. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Anything I missed? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so today uh, we're question, on that. The question was, what are we oh, doing for networking? Yeah, sorry, I forgot. Yeah, what, is it, what are we doing for networking? So in the networking slide, I talked about that. Today, it's the, the flat DHCP networking. So it's using the, uh, the uh, EB tables, IP tables, and the flat networking. So using the underlying network that the hypervisor, uh, like KVM, is providing. Um, or is it KVM or whatever, you know what I'm getting at. Um, uh, in the future, that's part of a roadmap. We're going to be looking at 10 gig on the physical side, you know, on the on the network side, commodity 10 gig, and getting to some sort of overlay, right? Some sort of uh, you know V switch of some kind. Uh, we know we can go pretty far with what we're doing, uh, but you know you get up to the 1500, 2000 VM range, and you'll have too much uh, traffic, too much broadcast when nodes enter and leave. Yes. So are you looking at infrastructure support? Is that kind of the layer or, or both? Yeah, um, yeah, so I mean we have an infrastructure uh, uh, service, you know, an infrastructure uh, support vendor that we use uh, for infrastructure monitoring for our cloud environments. Um, and uh, uh, they're not fully integrated into the private cloud yet, they're in the public cloud. Uh, we'll be looking at putting uh, their service, they have run like a small agent, uh, and then they have uh, monitoring automation and ticketing and stuff like that. So we'll be looking at that. We're not doing that now, uh, but that's part of the, part of the plan. You know, I don't know that that's, I don't know that they, we, at, we were in a, a session yesterday, and we kind of asked that question, well, whose distribution did you use, right? Um, I don't know if you know about Crowbar, but it pulls down. You, you point it to a, uh, a, a branch or a trunk, and then it builds, right? It builds that up, right? So I don't, I don't know that we want, are looking for any, any particular vendor stack. I mean, as long as it works and, and uh, we, we know the status of it, right, and can patch it. Uh -huh. On the networking question, um, do you guys actually see your customers asking you for an SDN solution with network visibility, or is it just you're doing it as part of the scale? Okay, you're you're getting at so beyond what they can do themselves. Yeah. I mean, because when when a team launches, right, they've got the private networking, right, um, the uh, the fixed, and then they get a, a set of floating, so they can put like a their proxy or their web host on the floating. Um, beyond that, we have had a bit of churn here and there. I mean. Uh, you know, a team needs a VPN connection or something somewhere. They need firewall rules, um, something like that. We did come up with a pretty unique thing for firewall rules. Uh, if teams are talking to other parts of the company, they can go in, they can uh, check in to Jenkins, their ports and, and uh, ranges that uh, they need connectivity to. Uh, then we have a process of, of taking that and, and going and requesting the changes made. Once those changes are in place, the job goes green. It actually tests the ports. Uh, so that's that's kind of help. I, does that kind of get into it no, a little bit? Yeah. I'm saying that why are you looking at SDN? What is the driving factor? Is oh, it, is it scale. Or uh, is scale. It, primarily scale. scale. I mean, you cannot just keep pushing uh, broadcasts right up yeah. to you know 1500, 1200, whatever that. No, we don't know the. I mean, there's no magic number, right? But you get up into the thousands. And you have VMs launching like we do all the time. We're going to have trouble, uh, and we are going to need to scale. Anyone else? Okay. Awesome. Great. Thank. Thanks Thank for you. coming. Thank you.